And uh, so what uh, the proposal is that uh, one would like to unify all fundamental interactions. And the proposal is to use non-commutative geometry as the framework for this unification. And uh, the essential point is that the symmetries that one sees in the standard model of particle interactions um, could correspond to some hidden symmetry which is related to the geometrical structure. So what we did is that uh, we really defined the framework and we, we fixed the geometry by specifying what we call the geometrical data which consists of an algebra, Hilbert space, Dirac operator, reality operator and the chirality operator. This is the physical language. And, you know, there are certain properties of how the commutators between the different members of the set. Usually how, you know, either they are either mostly commute or anti-commute. And uh, we said actually that uh, we define a left action on the Hilbert space, and we defined a right action, and this we defined to be J B star J plus psi, which is called B opposite psi, and we said that left and right action, this left and right action commute with each other. After that, we made physical requirement, physical assumption, I would say, And the physical assumption is based on the, on the observation that for all practical purposes, general relativity is a good theory up to unification scale. And even, you know, it will go all the way up to the Planck scale. Beyond the Planck scale, or even the Planck scale, you know, it will start to break down because one has to include higher order corrections or maybe, you know, the whole geometry, the whole idea of uh, continuous geometry will break down. Anyway, but this is a good symmetry. So we assumed that the space or the non-commutative space is a product of, you know, let me say a, uh, let me say M cross finite, and uh, similarly, uh, for the H, M cross H finite, G, M cross G finite. In other words, you really have a product geometry, and similarly, you have G, M cross G finite. And um, the only non-trivial is that the D will be D, M cross 1 plus gamma 5 tensor D finite. And uh, the next question we asked, essentially, what are the possible finite dimensional non commutative spaces? So we asked the question, can one classify finite non commutative spaces? 
And um, we also said another requirement is that we want to avoid mirror fermions. And uh, that really required this fixed, what we call the KO dimension of the finite space to be 6. As I remind you, you know, KO dimension is not a metric dimension. It simply has to do with the properties of the commutators of the D and the D bar. In other words, it has to do with the fact in which, under which conditions you really can impose Majorana and Weyl conditions separately or at the same time. And so that really required uh, the finite spaces to have dimension six. And um, so we did the classification and then we deduced at the center of the algebra with either C or C plus C. And um, in the classification, however, this was inconsistent with the, with the, with the KO6, B equal to 6. And this left only this possibility. And then we were left, actually, that the algebra of the finite space, AF, was essentially like MN of C plus mn of c, and variations, whether you know, replacing the complex with real or replacing the complex with quaternions. So all these are possible. However, we also, you know, we need, um, so at, at this point, we impose some isometry on the first algebra. This actually is an assumption. And uh, it reduced this to an algebra of quaternions. And we, you know, we said actually that the first non-trivial example was m2 of h plus m4 of c. And um, it means that the next one will be, you know, uh, m, if with chirality, it will be m4 of h plus m8 of c. And so on. You know, you have a tower of possible algebras. The question is the simplest is this one. The simplest is this one. Now, chirality really forces this M2 of H. Remind you what's M2 of H is the space of all two by two matrices who are, whose elements are quaternions. So here you are really going to get say Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Now, what's a quaternion? Quaternion can be represented as a two by two matrix of the form alpha, beta, minus beta bar, alpha bar. Bar is complex conjugation in this notation. And so any matrix of this form, so you really can represent all the quaternions in this very simple format. You can multiply them and so on. So now because of the chirality condition, this M2 of H, you know, you would like actually this element, which is this two by two matrix, which are quaternions, somehow to really commute with the gamma. And the gamma, remember, is like one minus one. So to commute with this matrix, and this really forces it to break into H plus H. So the conclusion is that the algebra of the finite space is essentially F H right plus H left plus M4 of C. So this is, this we determined the algebra of the finite space to be of that form. And the first example, and that really fixed, this fixed the elements of the Hilbert space To be 16 dimensional. They are really, I can call it psi alpha i, where this is a 2 right plus 2 left, and the i is a 4. So you know it's really 4 times 4. 
And as you see, this 3D correspond, correspond to having SU4 color, and you have two left, two right plus two left. Okay, <clears throat> so. So alpha is a spinner index. Here actually is uh, is really not is not a spinner index. It's uh, it's uh, it's acted on by the cationion. It's a doublet action. It's a doublet under SU2 right and SU2 left. So as you see it. Uh, now, further, <clears throat> what did we have? We also said that in this picture, in this picture, these spinners, you know, we are really going to get here 16, let me call it 16, and we are really going to get the 16 conjugate. But the 16 conjugate, of course, are not independent, and we are acting on this space, you know, 16, 16 conjugate. And this is the Dirac operator. Of course, you have here like 16 and 16 bar, 16 conjugate with the, with the star. Probably see. And then I really have this Dirac operator. So this will be the, uh, the space of Dirac operators acting on the fermions. So here you are really going to get a 16 by 16 matrix. This is another 16 by 16. And the question is that, what do we have here? And so here we really have two possibilities. Is that the Dirac operator, whether it really commutes with the center of the algebra or it doesn't commute. If it commutes with the center of the algebra, then what would it mean? It means actually that this, these spinners and the conjugate spinners don't talk with each other. If they don't talk with each other, you know, it means that this symmetry M4 of C is not broken. There's nothing that can break it. And it means that you are really going to get SU4 color. In addition, in addition, it will turn out actually that you really would not be able to have what we call Majorana masses. So that would not be possible to have Majorana masses in your picture. So, so this is a choice. And obviously, since we know that color, the color group is not really SU4, it's, it's really broken, we know that this actually ha this has to be imposed. Then what we really have shown uniquely, that the only possibility for Dirac operators is to have only one non-zero entry in this, you know, it's, as you see, it's a 16 by 16 matrix, but you really can have only one non-zero entry. Otherwise, the, what we call the properties A B opposite is equal to zero, and D A B opposite is equal to zero, which actually this is called order one condition. I will come later, actually, to this. Uh, I will explain this in great detail in the next lecture, is what's the significance of the order one condition. But I can tell you the significance is that the connection is really linear. You are not really going to get quadratic terms in the connection. If, if you don't take this condition, then it means that you are really going to have you know, the connection, which is d into d plus a plus j a star j inverse you are going to get an extra piece, which is really quadratic in the field, say. So this actually is a new phenomena. However, you know, we are really going to require that connections are linear. And if connections are linear, it means that this property is satisfied. And if this property is satisfied, one can prove unambiguously that you only can have only one non-zero entry in this matrix. What is the significance, actually, of this? This really has great significance, physically. And the significance it will have is the following. It will turn out, OK. So if you have a non-zero entry, what would happen, actually, is that this algebra does break. You know, what's the algebra here? You know, you have like two by two matrices. And what I'm telling you that this entry somehow becomes distinguishable from the other entries. And the h right, which is a doublet, which I have written as two, would really break down into a c plus the HL, plus this M4 of C actually also breaks into a C plus M3 of C. But the Cs really become identified with each other because of this condition. And this symmetry really breaks down uniquely into this symmetry. This is the left, actually. So this actually would be the final algebra that satisfies all the conditions of the non-commutative geometric space. 
In addition, I told you actually that the fermions were in this representation, two right plus two left and four. So this now breaks into as follows. This is, will be one right plus one prime right. Two left does not broken and four is broken into one plus three. This one is the lepton color and this actually are the three colors, red, yellow, blue or whatever. Now, if you look at these representations, then you really can write this as one right, two left one, plus one prime right, two left uh, one, plus one right, two left three, plus one right, two left three. Now, we can give them names. It's a state. This turned out to be the right-handed neutrino. This turned out to be the right-handed electron. As you see, it's one, it needs lepton. So these are the two leptons. And here, this would be the, uh, sorry, it's uh, not, I, don't know, I made a mistake actually. One right. Yeah, yeah, no, no there's no, no it's, uh, it's, this is plus two. Okay. Plus, yeah. Plus, so there's pluses everywhere. Oh, God, made a mistake. Let me erase actually, otherwise. Uh, yeah, it's a plus, it's not, uh, it's not the triplet. See, there is a U1, but that actually comes out. So, so this actually will be one right one, one right one, plus two left one, uh, two left one. Uh, okay. I think I better do it this way. Plus one right three and one prime left three. And then I have two left one and two left three. Okay. This happens to be the right hand neutrino. This happens to be the right hand electron. This happens to be the upright. Uh, sorry, not upright, yeah. One right, and this is down right. And this happens to be um, the electron neutrino doublet. And this happens to be up down doublet, which are left handed. So you really get all the representations automatically without any, you know, uh, maneuvering. It's just the, the in addition. The right, right -handed, uh... Uh, no, you have right, and this is left action. This is up, down, left. Oh. You know, this is the E new left. Yeah. Up, down, left. So you really get everybody. So it's a 16 representation and one. In addition, what's the significance of this sigma? The significance of this sigma, as we are really going to show that the Higgs field is there, and now we really can, you know, figure, uh, somehow anticipate. We can anticipate, actually. Uh, you know, in this picture, as you see, everybody, you have only chiral fermions, which means masses can only be obtained after the symmetry breaking. And after the symmetry breaking, it means that the Higgs field gets an expectation value. And in particular for, you know, everything will get, uh, you know, for example, uh, a new E left when you have H star. Uh, and then you have, for example, uh, you know, E right. And then you can take, uh, uh, yeah. So, all masses are really obtained, and, and similarly, you know, you are really going to get a new right, H star, and then there is sigma two, and new E left, and so on. So actually, all masses are obtained only after the Higgs field gets its expectation value, which is actually, uh, is, uh, is a standard feature in all this unification picture. In addition, actually, the most important part is that now, because of the, the sigma that I talked about, you really get an additional Majorana mass for the right-handed neutrino. So the right-handed neutrino, you are really going to get sigma r with the C, where C is a charge conjugation matrix. We are transposed Vr coupled to the sigma. And this actually, uh, I will show you later, that this really gives an explanation why the masses of the, right, of the neutrinos is extremely small. 
it's of the order, you know, the upper limit, I think, is something like 10 to the minus 2 EV, the present the upper limit, because... Uh, so, this actually would explain why the neutrinos have small mass, and one really can work out, for example, is really clear that the, you know, left-handed neutrino would get a mass, which is, uh, let me say, uh, as follows. Okay, so here you are really going to get, you know, the sigma for the right-handed, and then you are going to get uh, some v, v, and zero. And uh, it means if you work out the two eigenvalues of the right and the left, you really get mixed states. And the mixed states, so, you know, this sigma, let me call it w, you find actually one of the eigenvalues is... Uh, you know, approximately uh, W and the other is V squared over W. And... Um, v is much smaller than W. And V is, say, of order 10 to the 2, and W is order 10 to the, you know, 11 or 12. The GEV, which is really will be the masses of where the right-handed neutrinos would sit. And then if you really work out what is the mass of the left-handed neutrino mass of the new L, it will approximately is equal v squared over w, and which is really, you know, it's 10, 10 to the 4 over 10, 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 9 GeV, you know. So, it... A few EVs. A few EVs, few EVs yeah. Actually, you know, with that, one really can work it out. It's, it's really, you can easily make it 10 to the minus 2 EV and without any problem. And so this would really explain Give, which, and this is known, actually, it's called the seesaw mechanism. The advantage is that you really get it automatically. We don't really plant the seesaw mechanism. The seesaw mechanism comes out. is extremely necessary, and it's necessary because you, you need to break the color group, and then you need to put something, and then the nice thing that, it, you know, you can only have one singlet, which physically means only the right hand neutrino can have Majorana mass which makes sense because Majorana mass, it means that the particle should not have any charge, it should be neutral, and then it's only the new right. Uh, you can ask why the new left actually doesn't have a Majorana mass. Of course, it cannot have because the new left sits with the electron in the same doublet. And, you know, without breaking the SU2 left symmetry, you really cannot do it, you know, so. Yeah, but new R and ER do not make it a doublet. The new? The, the, the right-handed. And they are... You know, and electron do not, do uh, yeah. Not, not in this picture, actually. You know, in the other the picture... Left, the left sector makes a doublet. Exactly, yeah. Left sector makes a doublet. If you really go to unification scale, the picture may change, but, you know, this is a different story. That has to do with this uh, order one condition. If you really remove it, and then you really can have... You'll go to unification picture, but that's a different story, you know. It means, you know, what really holds at, at unification, whether we have a desert or we don't have a desert. That's but you right. assume that this, this bracket, D A with B O, V O is zero. That's this, exactly. Uh, this is assumption. The question, what happens if you remove this okay, assumption? Okay. But in your model, you assume that. Now, you know, it, it seems that this is a, the right picture is to assume, actually, this property. Uh, it's in the range. Uh, you know, if you believe that there is nothing up to up to all the inf but if you believe that uh, at unification scale you have a higher symmetry, which is you know h right plus h left, and you have more fields, then you ha you can remove that condition. The picture becomes much more complicated because then, of course, many more new Higgs fields enter, which are necessary to break the higher symmetry. By the way, so you have both an h and a sigma. H is just a notation for sigma. Uh, I have both H, yeah. I have H, actually, okay. So now, actually, I can talk about the spectrum of, of the particle. So, so sigma is a mean value. Right. Sigma is a mean value of H. No, 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 no. Sigma is not. Sigma is a new particle, which is the, will be heavy, actually, whose mass is something like 10 to 12 GeV. It's a new part. It's a new field. And is, this field is extremely important, actually, for the stability of the standard model, as we are going to show, actually, very soon. And this field is, it's what, it's a scalar? It's a scalar field, yeah. Complex. No, real. 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 And the H field is complex. H field is complex, yeah. 
Where is H? Yeah. Uh, H, okay. Now I'll talk about the spectrum of, of the fields. Where this H actually lives. So, uh, you know, we said actually, usually what you do, you can start from the arbitrary Dirac operator, and then you can start, you can generate actually the connection through fluctuation with, with, the, with, with inner automorphisms of the, of the algebra. So in this case, D goes into DA, which is D plus A plus J, A star, J inverse. And what's A? A is a one form in this language, which is ADB. You know, this actually is a, is a strange way of saying that, you know, you can always write a vector field A mu as summation of scalar functions, yeah? Uh, D mu of BI. You know, this is a representation. As you see, if you, you can have many, you know, you can really make a requirement that A, I, B, I is one without any loss in generality. This is, you know, this is an arbitrary set of uh, A, I, B, I, an element of C infinity of M, for example. So these are functions, and you can always write the gauge fields in this language. This is actually what it means, okay? For the usual Yang-Mills fields. So if these are algebras, then you generate, you know, uh, you generate, uh, a non-abelian gauge field. But this is the picture, so A is ADB. Now, however, you know, we have to remember that this D that I've talked about, this huge matrix, according to this picture is what? It's a 32 by 32 matrix. It's a 32 by 32 matrix. And in addition, we have to assume that we have more than one generation. You know, this is an assumption that we make which we, because uh, we cannot predict it. We know actually that we need more than one generation. The question, what's the number? Uh, we know that you need at least three if you would like to obtain the CKM matrix and things like that. So at least we know that at least there are three generations. So the number of generations have to be imposed by hand. And this Dirac operator, it means actually that every element has to be in generation space. And in this case, actually, it is 32 cross 32 cross 3 cross 3, you know. So in this case, it's really 96 by 96 matrix. In addition, this has to be tensored with the Clifford algebra. Why? Because remember, D is like gamma. The, it starts with, that, with gamma mu, D mu. So you see that the, the gamma and uh, you know, we said that D, it's DM cross 1 plus gamma 5 cross DF. So you are really tensoring with the, with the Dirac algebra. So in other words, actually, all these are Clifford algebra valued Dirac operators. And in reality, you know, you still have to multiply another 4. It's, you know, 4 times 6 hmm, is 3, what? Uh, 384 by 384 meters. 4 by 4 meters. Yeah, it's OK. They look huge. But however, you know, we invented some notation where everything can be written in, in uh, indices. And, you know, one really can do it on the computer with really little effort. You know, you just put it in Mathematica and it gives you all the expressions. Fields, in terms of fields, you know. Why do you test? I mean, D is linear in gamma mu. And the formula you write for A is still linear in gamma mu, so. Yeah, it's really, well, actually, it's just like that. It's gamma mu tensor D mu. Yeah, but it, it's at the level of the yeah, but, gamma uh, mu, not the algebra. Not the yeah, yeah, no, I mean, no, I said, you're right. What I said is that the Dirac operator, if I want to represent them as matrices, they would be that, of that dimension. Okay? Yeah. It's, you know, tensors, you know, you tensor the products. So, you know, the calculation is, it looks complicated, but it's really not because in the end, it's nothing but matrix multiplications. This is what I'm saying. All right, so let's see actually how this A would look like. So you say, all right, this A, okay. So now actually I can tell you that how, how the elements of the algebra would look like. And the elements of the algebra, you know, because we said this H right plus H left, it really looks like, you know, I don't know, maybe I should uh, use it. It's like X tensor 1 and 1 tensor y, where the x would act on this h plus h, and the y would act on m4 of c. So in reality, you know, we really can represent it simply in terms of matrices. And if you do that, what would happen? 
If you do that, then you discover that this A field, or even, you know, I can write immediately what the Dirac field is. So Dirac field has, as I said, it has, you know, 32 by 32 matrix, but, you know, and I, I can simply concentrate on 16 by 16 of them. How does it look like this 16 by 16? 16 by 16, and then you start actually enumerating. You have an element of the first left and the first right, and you discover actually that this D is essentially like gamma mu, D mu, and then you are going to get B mu in it, where B mu would be the U1 charge, and the U1 charge has to do with the C. And then you are going to get, I don't know, so usually you write IG and then IG prime, W alpha sigma alpha. So then this really would come into uh, matrices which has to do with H left. And, um, and again, actually, when I add this J A star J inverse, it really brings things from down to up and it really gives me if for quarks, and at least for the quarks, it gives me also the G3 V mu I, I don't know what I'm the I. What I would like, what I'm saying is that you really get exactly the correct, when you write psi, d psi, you get all the correct vector interactions. In addition, in addition, because, because of the tensoring here, gamma uh, 5 cross dF, you also get Higgs fields. What are the Higgs fields? The Higgs fields are nothing but the connections along discrete directions. Because it's really, you know, if you do it easily, you know, I give you an example maybe with two by two matrices. If I have, you know, just like A, B, C, D, you know, this is an algebra of this form. And uh, actually here, actually, it's, um, and uh, if I do the calculation with uh, gamma five, uh, yeah, so essentially I can take D to be gamma mu D mu, and here I can take it gamma five some scale, gamma five comes scale, and then I have gamma mu D mu. You'll discover actually that when you compute D, yeah, I think here I'm gonna have to take diagonal or something, D A, you'll discover actually that there are cross diagonal terms, and you are really going to get a gauge field A mu, and here some gauge field B mu, and here you're going to get H and H star. In other words, because this is with a gamma mu and this is with a gamma five, the off diagonal elements in the operator D will be nothing but scalar fields. And depending on the representation, for example, if you take SU2 cross U1 here in this symplectic picture, so this would be two by two and this would be one by one, you discover this H will become a doublet. It belongs to the two one representation, so you really get a doublet. Now, the nice thing about this is that you only get one Higgs doublet. You don't get two Higgs doublets. One, you know, a priori one would have expected that for the right-handed electron and, you know, the uh, neutrino, you should really get independent, but they, they are really related to each other because the algebra is fixed. So the upshot of all of this is that we really get only one Higgs doublet and we get all the correct representations or uh, all, the, all the right couplings of both the vectors and the, and, and the Higgs. So in this respect, the Higgs field is nothing but the gauge connections along discrete directions or along finite directions. All right, so what do I do with this? Now, what I need actually is really to get dynamics. Which, by the way, is the, is the limit of the Kaluza-Klein case where no, yeah, no, but not completely, because actually, if, if you do Kaluza-Klein... Yeah, but th there is a difference, actually. In Kalu if you do Kaluza-Klein, you know that you, only, you always get only a joint representations. Why? Because, after all, the gauge fields... Suppose I work in five dimensions, okay? In five dimensions, then I take, you know, suppose I take a yang mills theory in five dimensions. So I write it F mu nu. Let me write it like F m n squared, yeah? where m is like mu and then a five. So obviously this becomes f mu nu squared and then you are going to get d mu, I don't know, h squared, yeah? Actually in this case, okay, you are really going to get a scalar field, but it's really a commutator. Uh, if it's non-abelian, if it's non-abelian, then the phi and the a mu are both in the adjoint representation. 
as I remind you actually that, you know, A, because AM is A-M-I-T-I, -I, where TI usually is in that joint representation. And you are really forced to take all scalar fields in that joint. You would not be able to get the doublet, actually. So here you really get the doublet. And in addition, you really have no dependence on the extra coordinates. Because here, actually, the problem is that in this picture, a priori phi is a function of x mu and x5. And then what you do is that you take a Fourier series of x mu, I don't know, e to the i, whatever, x5, with a 2 pi or something. And you really get all these oscillators. And you say, OK, I only keep the lightest of them, which is massless. All the other states will have mass m squared. And m squared will have to do with the, is related to the radius of your circle. So you get an infinite tower of states, which is OK in string theory. It's not OK in field theory, but in string theory is OK. OK? You know, because then you really can, you can control the infinite tower of states. But in, in, field, the, in, uh, in field theory, it's much more complicated. Wait, so five-dimensional theory, it's not that complicated. No, no, but I mean, no, no, I mean, you know, for, for, for quantum, no, for quantum. The question is that, are you going to throw all these or not going to throw? Five-dimensional quantum theory, but anyway. Oh, so people actually use Kaluza Klein, they throw all this infinite tower of states. In, in string theory, they don't throw. Anyway, you know, Kaluza Klein would not really give you this picture. This is what I'm saying. It doesn't give you that the fermions all will live in, live in one representation and things like that. The nearest thing to this, of course, is the asymptote. All right, so let me see, let me see, continue and see actually what we can do with that. So the next thing is that we have to describe the dynamics. Now, you know, in this picture, actually, the fermionic action is given by half g psi, d psi. And one really can show that all Fermi, Fermi, which are kinetic, plus Fermi, Fermi vector, plus Fermi, Fermi Higgs are all included. You know, you generate them for, from simply writing psi d psi. OK? So the fermionic action is OK. The question, of course, we need this dA, the A fields, or the gauge fields, to be dynamical. You know, I simply cannot write psi d phi. I have to really find, in order to get a good basis, at least at the classical level, for my action, I have to find a good action, good action that represents the dynamics of the vector and the scalar fields. So what is that? So this actually, so we hypothesized at one point the, the, bosonic, the bosonic sector. The bosonic sector. So how to represent the bosonic sector? One thing actually has to do with the observation that if you look at the spectra of at the eigenvalues of the uh, of, of the Dirac operator, then this the eigenvalues are known to be geometrical entities. They really depend on the geometry and depend on the, on the curvature of the curvature of the space and the curvature of the connections. So, so what we said is that the spectral action, which you know can be found uniquely, to, which satisfies the property that if you really have two disjoint sections like two disjoint operators like D1 and D2, then you need the action to be additive. So that you describe these two disjoint sets, then one can show that this the unique action that satisfies this property and this action is invariant under automorphisms, and would satisfy that if you have d equal d1 plus d2, then trace if they are disjoint, then the action becomes the sum of the two pieces. And we take actually f to be positive function. One can, you know, argue why, whether it should be positive or not. But at least in the Euclidean version, we take it to be positive. It would really make good uh, what we call path integral in the end. All right. But this actually looks very arbitrary, you know. So I say trace of f of the square. You tell me what is f. And the answer is that it doesn't, you know, for our purposes, it doesn't really matter what choice of f we make. We simply 
do an asymptotic expansion of this function, and we keep, okay. So here, actually, you would immediately object because you tell me, look, this f of d squared, you really cannot write f of d squared because d has a scale. Remember, d is gamma mu d over dx mu and whatever. So it already has dimension one. So in order to, you have to read it to make it dimensionless, and you have to divide by a scale. Later, I will make actually this scale to become a scalar field so that we can control the scale dynamically also. Okay? You know, because you can write this. It's a It's a yeah. So you can put the dilaton and then you can, you know, see how far you can dilate the scale. And it has, you know, it has interesting uh, consequences. Uh, all right. So the question, how can we handle that? And the way we handle it is that simply, you know, you write first f of d squared. You know, I would insert lambda squared, but it doesn't matter. You first write it as uh, f s d squared minus s. And uh, then use the, so you put it in some kind, you know, of, uh, of uh, Laurent series, and then use the property that um, uh, d squared, let me see, it's what? 1 of gamma of s, 0 to infinity, I don't know, e minus t. Let me see again, I forgot exactly the, It last time, but uh, here it is. Okay, so what we have? Suppose that, you know, I can use this expression, trace of p minus s, p would be d squared here, is uh, 1 over gamma s, t, s minus 1, so I have trace of p minus s, uh, trace of E minus TP, and for this, I use the asymptotic expansion, which is uh, the CD, expresses this trace in terms of CD do it coefficients. So we write that summation and larger equal to zero, and minus four, Four actually, in this case, the dimension of the manifold um, over two, so it's n over two, n is two, so it's like this in this case, and a n of x, p, d v of x. And the nice thing about it is that actually these objects only depend on the operator d squared in this case. Now, for many faults without boundary, we know that a even, sorry, a odd is equal to zero. For many faults with boundary, we have a very nice situation, actually, because we can predict something that uh, occurred in uh, quantum gravity, and we can predict something called the gibbons Hawking term that's needed for the consistent quantization, well, for the consistent formula, Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity. When you write A n x p, and p is the operator. P is the operator, yeah. yeah. P is d squared in this case. Okay. You know, in reality, one really can write d, you know, p is, you know. No, right. Anyway, so. Anyway, so essentially, we, the nice thing about this actually... T expansion here, because you did not explain why we are allowed to do a small t expansion. Yeah, the, so the, this... Because uh, for the moment, there is a function f... Uh, right. So, as you see, however, because of the presence of this lambda, yeah, because of the presence of this lambda, this series would look like for, as follows. You are really going to get lambda for a zero, okay? And then, let me say it's f, uh, f4. Uh, usually, actually, uh, well, you see, we keep changing the rotation. So f2 lambda squared a2 plus uh, f0 a4 plus, I don't know, f minus 2 
over lambda squared a6. Okay, it looks like that. Now, if lambda is the unification scale, and we are really going to show that lambda must be of the unification, of the order of the unification scale, we are really talking about, this is suppressed, actually. See, as long as you are really below, be below say, Planck, all this will be suppressed, because you are dividing by the lambda squared. So all these terms will be suppressed, and, and the question is that, you know, you know, I think this I have to call F4 or something. Anyway, the definition has changed. See, I think what is F0, it is U, F of U, DU between 0 and infinity. So if you know the function, it's a number, and similarly F2 is the integral of F U, DU between 0 and infinity, and F4 is equal to F of 0, right? Now, uh, I think even if you use this function, which is simply a cutoff function, it means that the function, if uh, u is less than 1, remember u is d squared over lambda in this picture, lambda squared. So if u is less than 1, you take it to be 1, and otherwise you take it to be 0, you really get, you know, we're going to show that you really get an excellent answer with this cutoff function. Of course, one can improve on, you know, here you'll have somehow arbitrary coefficients with this. So a0, what's a0? It's a cosmological constant. It's simply, there is a number. So all these have been, at least the general formula of how to extract the a's out of the form of the d squared have been given by Gilkey. So all what you have to do is to use his, his um, prescription and Extract. Of course, actually, as I said, we have you know, 384 by 384, but this is a mere technicality because, you, after all, they are simply tensor product of matrices, and you can simply trace and take products. And so this is really mechanical in that. So we get that A0 is essentially is a number times root G to the 4x. And what's A2? A2 is another number into, with a negative sign, into R plus h bar h, you know, some coefficient here. And uh, so obviously we, we start to get, we get the Einstein term and we really get the mass term for the Higgs field with a minus sign, okay? At the level of lambda squared. At the level, yeah. As you see, this is lambda squared. It tells you, know, oh, you may object, you know, how can you get a mass of the Higgs, which is of the order of the, of, of the. But this is really a problem. Oh, I think, you know, this problem can be solved can be solved uh, by putting the dilaton, as I show you actually, in principle one has to take the dilaton into account, and um, then, but I will talk about this later, you, the, the problem of fine tuning could be reduced because you get something which is known as the Randall syndrome model actually, you know. So you get it, but you know, this was done before Randall syndrome, so uh, we don't use the name. Uh, but it's it's the effect. So yeah, because I will dis discuss this. Uh, so you are saying the first prediction is that the mass of the Higgs is equal to the Planck mass. Uh, well, actually, it's not. The, remember, it's a mass term. It's not the mass of the Higgs. The mass of the Higgs, of course, as you know, even in the standard model, is plagued by quadratic divergences. So even if you set it to be, you know, hundred or whatever, it when you run it, it becomes infinity anyway. If you don't keep tuning it at every order. So usually the mass of the Higgs is really controlled by the lambda coupling and more than the mu squared. Mu squared, this is a fine tuning problem of the Higgs field, which is a different story. But again, actually, I would say that, you know, the physical Higgs would have a mass, if you put the dilaton into account, would really have the physical field is not the H, but will be E minus phi H, you know. So the dilaton will come in, and if the dilaton acquires a potential and requires uh, an expectation value, then it's enough that this phi to be of order 40 or something in order to really have a tiny mass. So this is, this is possible, actually. Yeah, but still, you're talking about geometric unification. Yes. So we have Einstein. We are very happy to have Einstein with the Planck mass. Yes. We are saying H is like a geometric partner. The Higgs is yes. the beauty, it's the geometric partner. And at bare value, the Higgs as a mass term equal to the Planck mass. Okay. Yeah, bare mass term, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It is like that. Oh, oh, for the know. graviton, it does not, it's not. Oh, it's, it's just It's not right. changed. I mean, the, the, the Planck mass remains in the low energy physics of the graviton. 
Yeah, because this has to do with the fact, you know, remember, everything is bare. In the end, you are really going to get a classical action, and you really have to run all the, uh, all, all the coupling constants. And it's known, actually, that the, Newton doesn't run very much. This is what people, you know, Newton doesn't run very much, while the other does run a lot, actually, so. This yeah. is that. Why, why is it so? Because here they are geometrically unified. So you would well, say... Well, actually, if we look at all couplings, everybody runs differently. You know, we will discover that some, some couplings run a lot, some coupling do not run much, actually. And it's not the only one, because if I now go to the A4, and then what do I have A4? A4, you have some constant, and you are really going to get, actually, now, 5 over 3 g1 squared b mu squared, plus g2 squared w mu squared, plus g3 squared v mu squared. So this is v1 hypercharge. This is SU2 left. This is the weak Yangmans. And this is the SU3 angles, the kinetic terms. So you get, actually, and they have, they come exactly in this form, OK, plus then you are going to get d mu h squared. You get d mu sigma squared. And then you get, you know, I don't know, lambda h bar h squared. Actually, this lambda really comes as a fixed value. You know, it means, when I say lambda, it means I really, I'm, really, I'm going to get a number. And this number is determined by the Yukawa coupling of the particles. So here, everything really is well defined. It's not that you get something arbitrary. And the ratios, for example, g3 squared is, is this ratio. You get 5 over 3, 1, 1, which is known actually to be exactly what you really get if you have an SU5 gauge, uh, SU5 unification model. You mean really g1 squared or 1 over g1 squared? How do you normalize the thing? Because usually it's 1 over g squared with a geometric normalization. Yes. Uh, you know, you have here, so essentially what we do... Your field, they include yeah. the G or they don't include no, the G? No, yeah. So here, actually, as you see, it's, no, my fields include G. So I get this term, and then what do I require? You know, I have here some F0, right? So I require, actually, this number into F0 to be 1 over 4G squared. And obviously, if I would like to normalize things simultaneously, this really requires for me that G3 squared equal g2 squared is 5 over 3 g1 squared, OK? And this is my g squared. And then I can factor. And then I take f0 to be 1 over 4 g squared. And then you get, actually, without any g's in your expression. Yeah, but why are you imposing this unification here? I'm not, you know, I have to, norm I have to normalize. I have, you know, this comes on equal footing as this. I have to normalize my kinetic energy simultaneously because I can also redefine my fields. So in the end, of course, yeah, in the end, actually, what do I really get? I would get, you know, minus quarter b mu squared. Well, this 5 over 3, I think you have to. A plus w mu squared plus b mu squared. Because this is the normalized kinetic energy. It should come out with, the, with minus quarter, right? This is well defined. The kinetic energy of vectors. It's always minus quarter. OK, you want it to put this way. OK, yeah. So I have to normalize. And in order to normalize this, I have to define this to be like 1 over 4 g squared. You know, I have the right to define it to be given by some number. So I take it to be 1 over 4 g squared. All the g squared cancel. And in this respect, this is my unification. You are forced actually to have this unification. Because you can always redefine your fields, right? And, but you have to redefine them in such a way you get the canonical kinetic terms. In order to get the canonical kinetic terms, it forces this unification. You know, it's um, similarly here, actually, you know, you, with, with all this, it also tells you that, for example, uh, the lambda coupling, which is the quartic coupling of the Higgs field, is proportional to g squared, which is a situation which is familiar in supersymmetry. It's a, in, in supersymmetry, the lambda and the g squared are proportional to each other. So here we have also the same, same story, and that the lambda coupling of the Higgs is proportional to the gauge coupling. And it means you know, it would have similar RG equations. 
Anyway, what else do we have? We really get actually plus here. We get C mu nu rho sigma squared. This is the conformal tensor. Now, we don't really, and then we get Gauss Bonnet, of course. Uh, when I say RR star, it means, you know, epsilon nu rho sigma, epsilon A, B, C, D, R mu nu A, B, R rho sigma C, D. It's Gauss, it's really topological term. So you get this topological term, and, um, you know, you have surface terms and things like that, but the important thing is that you read this conformal square, and, of course, you know, here you stop. Now, here one may argue that uh, if you really have the conformal tensor square, then your graviton propagator, if you want to quantize the theory, would really have a ghost mode, you know. It's known that if you work out the propagator, you get something like k squared plus k to the 4 if you go to the... And it's uh, like this. It's 1 over k squared plus k to the 4 with coefficients, which you can write as 1 over k squared plus... Uh, here, maybe you have lambda squared or something, you know. And other k squared. And this you can write as, as, as a difference of two terms, which really shows you that there is a ghost term. However, actually, this, you know, but of course it makes the theory super unreasonable in a way. It makes it, it makes it well behaved at infinity. But then you have to say, oh, it's non unitary if I go all the way to the Planck scale. So you have actually, you'll have a problem with the unitarity at the Planck scale. But anyway, since we already declared that at the Planck scale something bad happens, this is not a serious problem. So the theory, actually, you really can work with it, and you can do normalization, and you can do everything, and you really can work with it an effective theory. They claim that this is a good effective theory. So where do I go from here? Anyway, so the essential so, point. So uh, if, if zero contains the cosmological constant, yeah. F2 contains the gravitation. Yes, mass, mass time. Mass yes. Mass and the uh, and, uh, uh, four contains kinetic term for all gauge fields, all young Mills fields, plus H conformal H squared, plus, you know, a kinetic term for the H, kinetic term for the sigma. So you really get everybody with fixed coefficients. But See, there is no potential for sigma. Yeah, yeah, there is sigma. I didn't write it, but, you know. You know, it comes with another with sigma to the four. You know, there is... Yeah, okay. it's, 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 the same reason they are yeah, the same expression, actually. You get a factor of half with different... Uh, the difference is that how they couple, you know, these coefficients really depend on, uh, for example, for this, it depends on the square of the Yukawa coupling. While this would come on the quartic term, the quartic power of Yukawa coupling. Okay? So, you know, everything is well defined. This is what, the important thing is that everything is well defined. So, <coughs> third, le third level contains all these kinetic terms for the gauge field. Exactly, yeah. Okay, where do I go from here? You know, here... But no mass term for the, here, for the gauge fields. No mass term for the gauge fields. Ah, there is, of course. There is, uh, you know, here. If you break symmetry, they generate mass term. Oh, yes, if you break symmetry, they generate a mass term. So, so what happens is the following, you know. Now, we really can start talking about... whether we can take this action seriously as, you know, the dynamical action of all the bosons that we know. And there are really two things that we can do. First of all, first of all, we can immediately give a prediction, actually, to the top quark mass. This we can predict. And the reason is the following. Uh, remember I told you that all terms, all masses, actually, are generated by coupling to the Higgs. You know, that's why in this popular thing they call it a God particle because it is, it's one responsible for masses for all. And the, here actually, you know, you really have some K, where K are, are what? K are the Yukawa coupling. It's all K psi bar psi H. Now, but this is direct masses because it's psi bar inside. Yes. No value on that. Yeah, well, actually, the Majorana, yeah, the, the Majorana of, you know, of course, you, are, you, are, you can have, you can, we can have K nu R, whatever, yeah, but that's, um, you're right, actually, the, the sigma, the, the Majorana is a different story, yeah. so it doesn't really affect uh, this one. So here, what do we do, actually, uh, 
we notice that this term here, there is some coefficient which depends on the Yukawa coupling, which you called A. And the kinetic term of the Higgs field comes with this A, and A depends on the square of the Yukawa couplings. Then you say, OK, I really have to normalize to make a proper kinetic term. I have to normalize the kinetic term so that in the end, it should be only half d mu h bar squared, right? D mu h squared. It should be just half without anything. So in order to that, we really have to normalize h into h over square root of a f0, where f0 is whatever temperature. Now, if we do that, this term becomes k over square root of a psi bar psi h. But this a, then actually, I discover actually that if I square this term k squared over a, if I square this term, I really get 1 with a summation. Because a is defined to be the sum of k squared. So from here, we deduce that at the tree level, we have a formula which tells me essentially the mass of the electron, or well, of course, you know, I'm talking about now three families, mass of the neutrinos plus three masses of the D plus three masses of the up is 8mw squared. Because it has to do with the VEV of the H, and the VEV of the H has to do with the W mass, we really get an identity, and this identity is this one at the tree level. We really get it. Yeah, we know. You can write at the term of the Yukawa coupling, you know, the same. Because in the end, everything is multiplied with the V squared, and plus 3m squared up would be m, I think, g squared or something, you know. Maybe it's 4g squared or something. I think something like this. This really already tells me, we know actually that the mass of the top physically, the mass of the top quark is dominant. It's, you know, it's, uh, if you square it, it's much larger than anything else. Remember, it's of the order 173 GeV, while the rest is like, you know, the largest is like 5 GeV or something. So if you square it, it three really dominates everybody. And it means, it means. And what is the MW in 90 something? Yeah, well, actually, I can write it as 4G squared. Yeah, you are right. It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, 80, it's like 80 GeV, actually. Anyway, so this actually tells you that the m squared of the top is like 8 over root 3 mw squared. I can take the square root. So it is 2 uh, root 2 over 3 mw. And uh, however, this is a three level. And then, of course, you really have to run it down with that, which I'm going to write actually the organization group equations, how they run down. If you run it down, actually, Ignoring actually this term, we discover we cannot really ignore this term because you'd expect that the neutrino mass is small, but it's not really small. What we know is that it's only the CISO mechanism that makes it small. So there is no reason actually for K nu to be small. However, if we know, if we ignore it in the zeroth approximation, you know, you really get something like 175 GeV or something immediately uh, for the top quark mass. So it's really one of the predictions of the theory. Then we discover actually later that you cannot ignore this. And then you really, you know, you can predict it, but not to decimal points. You know, you have some room for, uh, you have actually one, uh, one variable in the story. So let me then continue. The mass around, you know, around, around, you know. You cannot. It's very close to the experimental value. It's very close to the experimental value. However, however. Now, let me, let's look at the Higgs sector, because in the end, we have to make a prediction of the Higgs sector. And I told you last time, we did make a fatal mistake, and we predicted the wrong Higgs sector. And the, and the culprit in all of this is that uh, in our analysis, we dropped, we assumed that the sigma is irrelevant. We said, look, it's 10 to the 12, or who knows, you know? It's very high. It will not affect anything. But it did. It does, you know, and I'm going to show you, that does tremendously, actually. You know, it really gives you a factor of, I don't know, 0.8, whatever the Higgs mass is, because of this neutrino contribution. So that actually we ignored, and in a way, we really paid a heavy price for it. But why do you put, I mean, sigma as a potential also? Right. Because 
what is nice in unification is indeed, as you just said, you make predictions. So right. a priori, at some scales, everything is equal to everything else. Right. We have many things. So what are the conclusions for the mass? Is the mass of the sigma equal to the Planck mass equal to the mass of the Higgs? At this, lambda, for instance? Yeah. As you know, no. the problem with that, with this we cannot say. We cannot, we, we cannot say what's exactly the mass of the... We only can say that in order to get good properties that we need to get the neutrino masses of a certain order, for which we have to assume that the sigma is of order 10 to 12. Now, this is another fine tuning. Remember, actually, you know, there is fine tuning. Before saying that, you should say there exists a lambda mm -hmm. where the mass of the sigma is equal to the mass of the Higgs is equal to we, the Planck mass at this lambda, and then you can... As you know, lambda. As you know, we, the problem is the following. We really have quadratic divergences in the model. You know, and in any and all these things, if you don't have supersymmetry, you will face immediately the problem of quadratic divergences. You know, the main... For the scalars. For the scalars. Yeah. And this is really the main... So essentially, the lambda, the quadratic couplings, we can run and we can determine completely. But what we really cannot control is the quadratic divergences, and then, of course, these would affect actually exactly the mass of the Higgs, the mass of the sigma. So we, don't, we, can, we can only say that, look, the vacuum expectation value, that is something like 10 to 12 GV, and then everything we can make predictions. And um, this actually, this number comes also from another, for, I would say actually, where does it come? Why should it be 10 to 11 and not something else, actually? But, okay. but still, I mean, the bare value of all the masses of sigma is equal to 10 to the 19 j squared, okay? Uh, well, that, actually, yes. That, that was a prediction, okay? Now, so you should not be afraid of quadratic divergences because you start from... Yeah, but, 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 then they can be diminished, if the sign is okay, by quantum fluctuation when you go to lower... But they are uncontrollable. The problem is that the question... The, the, because of quantum divergences, it means that if you do one loop, you get infinity. You do two loops, you get another infinity. And you have to do it at every order. So this is the, this is the hierarchy problem. You really cannot rely... You know, once you have quantum divergences, you say, OK, I cannot control. You have a cutoff, so you, you should take the logic. Yes, but we, we have a cutoff, but also we have no control over the values of, of the running at all because of quadratic division. We don't know. Well, Nobody well, knows. Why not? I don't understand. You have a, a differential equation, dm square over d lambda square equal yeah. something, a number. And you, and you have an, a boundary value, which is m Planck square. Yeah. So you can see if it goes up or down. No, but the problem is it's infinity. It's not that, you know... You, it's not you, infinity, you have a cutoff. By definition, you are telling us I have an f of d over lambda. So you yeah. must put a cutoff, otherwise there is no meaning in, in this. Therefore, you have a cutoff. Therefore, you can start the ODEs, I mean, the renormalization group at this cutoff and see where they go, no? Uh, Why do you abandon, if you have predictions here, use them? Uh, I think the problem, I don't know, the problem is that, you know, people, when they treat the problem of quantum interventions, they are, you know, renormalization scheme dependent. They have, you know, I think nobody deals with them. I can tell you that nobody deals with the quantum interventions. Once people have them, they simply... But because it's the, they do in reverse. They yeah. start from uh, low energy and then they say, okay, I go up to infinity. You are doing the reverse. You start from M Planck, which is for you finite, and you go down. Mm -hmm. So this is like a well-defined scheme, no? Uh, okay, but continue. Yeah, I, anyway, I, you know, the way I know that it's not, even there is not defined yet. Yeah. So this actually, yeah, this is fine, this is a fine tuning that we do. Why it's just, we don't know. Fine tuning. And this fine tuning is also needed for, as I said, the CISO mechanism, because otherwise you don't really get the right order of masses for the neutrinos. In addition, the standard model will break down anyway, as I'm going to show you in a minute. But standard model breaks down because if you would like to get 125 GeV Higgs mass, then you really cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, Okay, if you run up, it will become negative at 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12. And it becomes unstable. All right, so let me see actually what happened. Let me write for you actually what's the Higgs potential. 
in this respect. After I rescale, because as I told you, we really have all these fields, they come not scaled, and then we have to rescale them to make them in the physical. We have to scale the kinetic terms. And, uh, and we really make an approximation, not a, uh, yeah, we make an approximation that the top quark mass, M top, is much larger than M of all fermions, you know. Which is, you know, it's, it's an assumption you make. It simplifies the analysis. You don't have to worry about many fermions, you worry about one. So we can write, actually. Okay, so now, actually, you know, h bar h essentially is set to be 0 h after you expand around the vacuum expectation value. We know the other particles will be absorbed, so I'm only going to keep the Higgs, which will be observed in the laboratory. So. It is of this form, and then you have lambda h sigma into h squared sigma squared plus lambda sigma sigma top form, which is the usual stuff. And then actually we have something like, I don't know, minus uh, 2g squared over pi squared f2 lambda squared into h squared plus sigma squared. And uh, what's lambda h? will be something like n squared plus 3 over m plus 3 squared 4g squared lambda h sigma and we have assumed that k nu is root n k up in other words you know we assumed that the neutrino mass is, is not small, uh, the direct neutrino mass, or the Dirac type in neutrino mass is not small, it's some number n. Actually, this number n, you know, uh, to fit the experimental values, somewhere is between 2 and 3, actually, or 1.6 and 2.4 or something. Anyway, so we really have this. Now, what are these? These actually lambdas are governed by renormalization group equations. So we really can write the RG. The, the Yukawa case, okay, mm -hmm. are governed by renormalization groups and they are logarithmically dependent. So you have a prediction, I mean, you cannot impose, like all the k's are equal. At, no, no, but I, this is my three level. No, but remember actually all these conditions, yeah, that you're on, but you have, we have actually a, a, a relation which holds at unification, at this scale. So this relation, I can start from it and go down. That's what we do. Yes, but is it, is it not saying that all the Yukawas are equal? Not, no, they are, uh, Yuka, no, the Yukawas, the Yukawas, as you see, now we ignored all the Yukawas except for the top quark mass, because the rest, the rest are negligible compared to the top quark mass. This actually is the dominant factor. You can, you can get, by including others, you can get the correction, but it's known to be less than 1%, actually. Yeah, if one of them starts going up. Yeah, but here you want that two Yukawas are comparable. Uh, which one? Ah, this one, yeah. For this, actually, and for this, we have to run both, actually, yeah. Y yes, so, I mean, this is an OD. So, I mean, two directions have to go up and others go down. Right? Yeah. But that you can check. You don't yeah. need, you should not make an assumption. You have to show that there are directions where two Yukawas no, get stay large or not. Uh, In these are logarithmically divergent. They are not right. quadratically divergent, so you cannot say argue by hand waving. I mean, you have to uh, prove something here. Yeah, In principle. You, you, okay, what you're saying that the question whether this, this is actually, this, we only do this at one point. You know, okay, we didn't do. We, you have a point where everything is normalized. So. Yeah, yeah. No, this actually is, okay. In order to simplify our analysis, we said this is related by some number. We don't know what this number is, yeah. We don't, we don't say in the end what this number. We cannot determine it. We are fitting it to experiment. But you should. You have, all the, you have a lot of information. I mean, the beauty of geometric engineering is to make predictions. So why are you suddenly doing phenomenology, say, let me forget completely about the predictions and tune it to the data? That's what you're saying. We're not tuning here. We only, we only said that. Okay, but no, no. You, you, you don't face what are the predictions. We are, you know, look, we, we, this actually, all these relations hold at unification. And this actually, we are going to write the RG equations, not taking this, 
And this actually is only a boundary condition on the differential equations. So all these are at unification. Exactly. This is only boundary conditions at unification because, after all, you know, RG equations are differential, first order differential equation. So you need some boundary condition. So these are all boundary conditions. Fixed by the geometric unification. Yes. So you cannot impose square root of n. No, no, but n actually is just a parameterizing number to get an idea what the n should be. We've done that, we know. No, but you, you know whether it's one or two thirds. Uh, That's what I'm saying. If you just normalize things at lambda, everything is determined from the geometry. Yeah, but the problem that we, for, see, this is a, yeah. I agree with you in principle, since we don't know what KNU is now, because nobody has measured the direct Dirac neutrino mass. So this actually is something that we cannot control, we cannot compare with the data. So we have to assume there's some relation. If we knew the value of KNU now, then we would have actually, you are right, then we would have, you know, looked at the equation. But since we don't know the initial value, or the present value, sorry, we don't know, because nobody has measured what is the present neutrino mass, because that's also related to this Majorana mass, the CISO mechanism. There is an unknown there. If this unknown is one day measured, of course we'll be able to make a prediction for that, okay? But for the time being, we don't know that, so we assumed that it's really, this actually is parameterizing our ignorance, that's all. Yeah, I'm just saying, probably you have less in your answer than you are saying, but anyway. Yeah, no, I would agree with you if we knew the, the value now, because then we can run it up, it's true. But since we don't know the value now, I don't know, there is no point in running something you don't know up. This is what I'm saying. Okay, anyway, look what happens. So, what happens is that, you know, I can write all this uh, RG equations, as Tibu said, you know, for example, the beta of the GI is very simple, which, you know, something like the GI by DT is given by 1 over 16 pi squared, BI, GI cube, and this actually BI are three numbers, which are 41 over 6, minus 19 over 6 and minus 7. And this simply tells me that if I define alpha i to be gi squared over 4 pi, and I plot the alpha 1 inverse and the alpha 2 inverse and the alpha 3 inverse, then I get something like this. This is alpha 1 inverse. Alpha 3 inverse. We plot it actually, and one really can plot it from the present experimental values, and then you can check actually that they don't exactly meet, you know, there, there is some like 4% discrepancy between the meeting points. Uh, however, actually, you know, these equations could be improved because this is, you know, the first order, there's second order loop corrections. Unfortunately, actually, second order loop corrections has not been worked out taking the they have been working out to three loops, but not taking the singlet sigma into account, because we discovered that sigma makes a big difference. So, and, uh, you know, I'm asking people who do these calculations, and it uh, seems that nobody has already started doing this. So. Anyway, we know actually how the top quark mass. So we get some relations, you know, minus 17 over 6. So people have really worked out these things. So we are really going to get a system of coupled differential equation. And the important thing is the following. Delta d lambda of h over dt will have terms which are proportional to the h and the h sigma coupling plus the usual stuff. And simply, the lambda h would move. So the, they all actually you really get coupled system of differential equations for all the h and the sigma coupling. And this is the thing that we missed. We said that you know they are really independent, and we didn't put. However, if you if you do that, what happened is the following. And because you forgot about the sigma. We forgot. Well, actually, we have it in there. We wrote the Lagrangian. But at one point, we said, OK, in our RG analysis, we ignore a sigma, OK? okay? okay? Because the decoupled things. Yeah, we assume they are decoupled. You know, because we have not looked at, you know, people have already done the calculation, but we were not aware that people have done the calculation. They did it like two years earlier, 
but we didn't, uh, we didn't know, you know. We are not phenologists after all. But of course, it's not, it's not an excuse. <laughs> so, if, uh, not to be aware of something. Anyway, so what happens is that uh, they really, you know, I will give you a, a plot of. So the nice thing, actually, all this could be worked out using mathematics, actually. Uh, you simply give the equation, and the mathematics gives you the solutions to the plot and everything. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, I think this is lambda sigma, and this is h sigma, and this is h. And uh, this is like zero point, I don't know, two or something. You know, this starts with two, which really becomes weak at low energies. Now, what hap what's the interesting thing of the following is that the m squared, you know, obviously the h and sigma states are mixed, so you really have to diagonalize your system. And uh, you really get actually two eigenvalues for the m plus squared and minus squared. This is a, you know, and this actually would be lambda h v squared into one minus lambda squared h sigma over lambda h lambda sigma. And the important thing is the following, you know. This is the thing we predicted without the sigma, and you really, you can come something like, you know, 170 GeV, okay? It's three really between 160 and 175 or something, you know? This is actual, this is what we predicted some time ago, okay? Now sigma actually, as you see, because this W is, if we assume it's 10 to 12, of course it will be 10 to 12 GeV. Depending on the expectation value that you are going to assume for the expectation value of the sigma. Once that is done, then of course actually the mass of the Higgs is really given by this. This is the usual, you know, as I said, this is the 170 squared or something, but then it is really reduced by this factor. And this factor you have to measure at this point. If you measure at this point, you get that this factor is something like 0 0.8. So it reduces the 170, okay? Well, of course here everything is squared by a factor of 0 0.8, you know? So the essential point is that if you really work it out, you get a number which, without doing anything, is somewhere between 120 and 130 GeV. Okay? Now, this is really important because Suppose that I didn't have the sigma at my disposal, you know? And then I worked out simply the lambda h coupling. So the lambda h coupling starts from this very small number here, and it really goes, and if you don't have the sigma, it really goes like this, actually. And it becomes zero at 10 to the 11 GeV, and it becomes negative afterwards. This is actually why people were not very happy when the start, when, uh, 125 or 126 GeV, when the Higgs was discovered to be 126 or 125, because it really make the standard model, if you'd like to promote it to high energies higher than, uh, to higher energies, assuming that nothing else is found, it will break down, you know. It means it become unstable at 10 to 11 GeV, and lambda becomes negative. Not so if you put... At 10 to the 2, still 10 to the 3, probably. So, anyway, but this actually, that actually people, uh, of course, actually, if you assume that something would be found, you don't worry about this problem because you say, okay, something else will happen. But if you believe that the standard model is a good model up to, up to higher energies, then you are immediately in trouble with this 10 to 11. And the only way out is that you would assume that there's some scalar that enters in this, which would have similar coupling. So people assumed actually all these properties, and then they, you said you, you can save the model if you introduce a singlet, okay? Now, the advantage that we have is that we didn't have to assume anything. The sigma was there. And we have the other advantage that the initial values of these is fixed for us. Well, more or less fixed because we have this n, which we still we don't know, you know? We still don't know because of our ignorance about the Dirac mass of the neutrino. But more or less, for a wide, for a wide range of the n, you always get the same pattern. So essentially, you know, uh, we, can, we can get, 
give a good value for the, for the Higgs mass, which... Uh, now, uh, one thing I can mention... What about the sign of mu square of the Higgs minus? Yeah, you know, it, it comes with a minus sign. Why it comes? It's easy to understand why it comes with a minus sign. Because after all, remember, we are really expanding this guy, yeah? So you get 1 minus Td squared plus, of course you have to do integration, but it tells you that, you know, you are going to T squared, therefore. That, you know, this and this would have opposite signs. This is the kinetic term and this is the mass term. It's a heuristic argument, of course, you know. Uh, which in the beginning I was completely surprised, but then after I look at that, but it's nice actually that you really get the minus sign that you are really going to get lambda h to the 4 minus mu squared h squared. And this relative sign is really extremely important that otherwise you would not have any symmetry breaking. So this is quite nice. Um, since my time is up actually, I would like to mention one final thing actually about, you know, maybe one would... Uh, Doubt, actually, why the spectral action should be taken seriously, okay? I will give you, I will give a, what we call supporting evidence that the spectral action is a good action even for gravity. You know, suppose that I was only doing gravity, yeah? And I, I won't simply, I would ignore gauge fees, I would know, I want to do general relativity, okay? Then I take actually this trace of Fd squared, and as I told you, you get a cosmological constant, and you get root gr, okay? Now, and you know, I'm really getting, say, a minus sign, so I, I can, you know, tune my first coefficient to be minus 116 pi g. But assume that my manifold has a boundary, yeah? Then, is known that you have to add this term to the Einstein action. Why do you have to add this term? The reason you have to add this term is the following. It depends on the geometry of the boundary. Dep yeah, this actually is called, you know, it's, it's the curvature, uh, the second fundamental form, and uh, this is the curvature on the, on, the, on the boundary. And this is the metric on the boundary. So. And it's known, actually, that you have to give exactly the sign and the coefficient to be, you know, in certain conventions, once you fix the conventions, there is a factor of two. Where does this come from? Now, it's known, actually, that R, as you know, now I'm writing, uh, going to write it cryptically, is d gamma plus gamma gamma, where gamma is Christopher connection, okay? What is gamma? Again, cryptically, is g inverse dg. You agree? Therefore, the first term will give me dg inverse dg plus g inverse d squared g, and the second term will give me g inverse dg squared. Okay? So, we see actually that the gamma gamma and the first derivative are of the same form. It's g inverse dg, dg uh, here. dg inverse dg inverse, with g, this is the same, same, same guy. However, I have a term with g inverse d squared g. Now, if you want to do Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity, then you have to face, say, the, find the momentum, which is dl over delta, you know, dg. So you have to take, actually, with respect to a time derivative, you have to find the momenta. Now, this term, d squared g, would prevent you from doing that. You have a d squared g. So what do you do? You integrate by parts. You integrate by parts, but, you know, you integrate by parts, but if you integrate by parts, you know, what do you really get? You know, you really cannot get rid of this term. You really have to get, to get to go rid of this term, you have to introduce a boundary term. Okay, to integrate by parts, right, you introduce a boundary term, but you have to cancel the boundary term with the manifold as a boundary, and the thing that cancels the, the boundary term exactly is the root of this HK. That's why, actually, Hawking and Gibbons, like 77 or so, they proposed that the Einstein theory and the Hamiltonian formalism would only make sense, even actually in the Euclidean path integral, would only make sense if you introduce this term. There are many arguments, and you have to have exactly this sign and coefficient. There's a factor of two between here and here, okay? 
Now, integration by part. because of the integration by parts, in order to kill this quadratic term in the derivatives. So, now let's see actually, suppose, you see, I, this I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I can get through GR, but I have no control on the DM. So, on the other hand, actually, this heat kernel expansion has also been worked out for many faults with boundary, and there is a formula for it. So, you go and you do actually some calculation, not easy actually, but well defined. And what you really get, you get exactly this combination of terms. To a sign, you know, without any ambiguity, you get that. So in other words, of course, you know, one of course can explain it, why it really gives you the right time, because essentially you are really solving an eigenvalue problem, and you have to tell me what's the, you know, and this operator psi, deep psi, must be Hermitian, this hermeticity would force you actually take a boundary condition of the psi on the boundary that it should be zero. And if you do that, you know, once you take this condition, you apply the prescription of computing, you know, the heat, the series with coefficients. And I told you actually that A odd, for example, A1, equal to zero for many force with boundary. But for many force with boundary, it's not equal to zero. You compute, you get exactly this term with a factor of two. Okay? So this shows actually that this spectral action knows is there. Ah, there is a. Ah. <laughs> so the spectral action knows about, uh, you know, quantization, I would say. Quantization of. Oh, well, you're just saying it is a better functional because the simple argument is. This is a functional of the metric uh, differentiable only if you include the boundary terms. Yes. The boundary. Right. So this is normal, but the spectral action, which has indeed However. assumed to be this, However. contains it. Yes. Assume. You know, I would go along with you. Assume that I don't take D as my fundamental object. I take it to be the Laplacian, yeah? And then I take F of delta, yeah? You discover that you'll get the wrong answer. You do, okay, you, do, you don't get the two. You get a different number. So, <laughs> you really have to take the Dirac in order for it to work. And this is not a coincidence because it's really very precise. You know, I can take any other operator. I always get the wrong answer except to the Dirac operator. And you really get exactly the right answer. And we did, that, we did it exactly, you know, for the whole standard model. And we really get exactly the same coefficient, not for this simple R theory, but for the whole theory, actually. And you know, and that was a rough calculation, but you really get exactly the right answer. So there is something, something deep goes there, which we don't fully understand, I think, you know. So I think uh, I will stop uh, here. However, maybe I have to ask you, because Tibo told me that next week there are some many events, <laughs> many events uh, we know, with Maxim. And uh, so what about postponing for a week the last lecture? Would you? I'm in favor. I don't, I'm not here next week. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. So maybe I think I can announce, you know, what about you, Thibault? Would it be okay that we don't do it next week, we do it the week after? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we, I'll announce that it will be postponed one week so that people who would like to attend the, the Maxim uh, celebration, then they can do that. All right? Anyhow, I will not be there next week. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, many people know there's also a string meeting next week, so people, some people will be, I don't know, you know, so. June is a no food in the month. <laughs> Too many events. Right. Okay, thank you.